This is Fit to Succeed in partnership with NordicFitnessEducation.com with host Ben Pratt. Thanks for joining us. In the cow, her foramen is at the beginning of her digestive system. Right. So everything digests in there first, then it moves in the intestines and it gets absorbed. In us human beings, our equivalent of rumen is at the end of the digestive system. The absorption has already happened higher up. So the plants are really in no position to truly feed the human body. listeners and welcome to another show of the Fit to Succeed podcast. I'm excited today because I have a friend and colleague, someone who I've looked up to for a long time, who is an expert in health, nutrition and neuroscience. Natasha Campbell McBride, or should I say Dr. Natasha Campbell McBride, it's so wonderful to have you join us today on the show. I'm delighted to be here. Thank you for inviting me. Oh, it's such a pleasure. Now, today in particular, we're going to be talking about a subject which uh, can sometimes cause a bit of controversy, but it, I'm hoping today we'll find some balance with regard to this subject. That is the subject of vegetarianism. And just before we jump into that, Dr. Natasha, I wonder if you could perhaps just share a short summary of your uh, clinical nutrition practice so that people have an understanding of where you've come from and your background. I'm a medical doctor, and I'm the creator of the GAPS concept and GAPS nutritional protocol. GAPS stands for gut and psychology syndrome and gut and physiology syndrome. What it basically is, uh, we're talking about gut flora in a person and how it affects the health of the rest of the body. So that was my first book, which is called the GAPS book, Gut and Psychology Syndrome. Mm -hmm. Then I've written a book on heart disease and I've written other books. And my latest book is on vegetarianism. The reason for that is because in my clinic, I work with a lot of mentally ill patients. And I was getting all these anorexic girls who got very ill, became anorexic because of misguided vegetarianism. And that spurred an intense study into the subject. And very quickly I discovered that there is no solid scientific data for us to rely upon. All the studies that were published were done by pro-vegetarian lobby. They are manipulated and they cannot be trusted. So I had to look into basic sciences of biochemistry, physiology, agronomy, and clinical practice of holistic doctors. And based on all that knowledge, there is plenty of information. I have written the book, Vegetarianism Explained, which came a year ago, and it explains all the ins and outs of how plants work in the human body and how uh, animal foods work in the human body. So let me jump into it straight away. There is a pro-vegetarian propaganda, which is getting very intense in the Western world. Uh, even the mainstream now is pushing the whole population of the world towards vegetarianism mm -hmm. um, using uh, various um, facts which are not really true. So we need to look into this. There is much, much more to it than what, is, uh, what you see in the popular media. Mm -hmm. I was going to ask, could we start just by maybe setting the scene there, Dr. Natasha, uh, with regards to the statistical data? You know, it, it, how prevalent is vegetarianism today and, and has that changed? Is it the same? Is it rising? Is it falling? It isn't very prevalent. Uh, it, it isn't. Uh, the, the largest vegetarian community lives in India and uh, they are vegetarians not because they've chosen it, but because of poverty. Mm -hmm. um, in India, there are so many people. It is one of the most populated countries in the world. I've just come back from India, actually, a few oh, days wow. ago. That's good. Yes. And that's right. And uh, Indians who live along the coast of the sea, rivers, lakes, or anywhere else, they eat fish. They eat seafood. They eat fish for breakfast, lunch, and dinner, and they value that food the most. It is the most important piece of something on their plate. And vegetables and rice are just eaten as a complement to the fish. Mm -hmm. People who live away from waterways and who don't ac have access to fish are vegetarians out of poverty, out of they have no choice. Because if Indians start eating animals, they probably will eat them all in two right. weeks. There are just so many people there. So they have to be very careful. Why do you think a cow is a sacred animal in India? Because they give them animal food. She mm -hmm. gives them milk butter, ghee, cheese, cream, and they know, Indians, they know for thousands and thousands of years that they cannot survive without this food. Mm. That is why cow is a sacred animal. You cannot kill a cow in India. 
Majority of these families who live away from waterways also have ducks and chickens and they eat a lot of eggs. And that's again, they're a very important part of their diet. Mm. So, and all the vegetables that they have, if they have any chance to add ghee to it or cheese or um, any meat that they can get, and whenever they get the chance to get meat, they do not say no to it, they eat it. The evangelical Western style, style vegetarianism came from the activities of Nathan Pritikin and his books, there was this evangelical vegan who lived in New York um, mm -hmm. at the beginning of the 20th century. And he's written extremely successful books promoting veganism. And it is his teachings that arrived to India at that time and right. took hold as religious or political veganism. So those vegans from India that you meet who are very, very um, rigid about it come from that movement. Mm -hmm. But majority of vegetarians in India are vegetarians out of uh, no choice, right. basically. So we've covered India. In the Western world, vegetarian percentages of vegetarians are much, much smaller, around 5%, maybe 8% of the population. Mm -hmm. But there is a very intense push now from the mainstream for all of us to become vegetarians, more or less, for all of us to become vegans, more or less. Where does that come from? I explain that in my book. I explain that human beings cannot live without animal foods. And Mother Nature gave us two groups of foods on our planet. It gave us animal foods, meat, fish, eggs, and dairy. Mm -hmm. And it gave us plants, grains, beans, vegetables, fruit, and, and so on. Mm -hmm. And both groups of foods are important, but they work very differently in the human body. So let me explain how that works. Please. All the energy on our beautiful planet is recycled. New energy comes from the sun. In order for something in nature to capture the sunlight, and turn it into a solid matter that we can touch and eat, Mother Nature created plants. They have photosynthesis, they capture the sunlight and turn it into the green mass. Mm. In order then for something else to eat the sunlight in the form of the plant matter, Mother Nature created herbivorous animals. Cows, goats, giraffes, antelope, deer and other herbivorous animals. They uh, eat plants. And in order for them to be able to digest the plant matter, Mother Nature equipped them with a very special digestive system called rumen. Mm -hmm. A cow has a huge four-chamber stomach called rumen, full of microbes. Bacteria, viruses, protozoa, flukes, worms, archaea, there's a huge microbial community there, mm -hmm. which digests the grass for the cow. It's not the cow that digests the plants that she eats, it's those microbes in her rumen that break it down for her. Mm -hmm. And the interesting thing is that more than 70% of all sugars, all the carbohydrates in the plant matter that the cow consumes, are converted into short-chain fatty acids, which yeah. is a fully saturated fat, and they absorb in that form. So the cow actually lives on a very high-fat diet. In order then for something else to be able to benefit from the sunlight, energy of the sunlight, in the form of herbivorous animals, Mother Nature created the next group of creatures on the planet, and these are uh, predators and omnivores. Mm -hmm. We human beings belong in that group. We don't have a rumen. We have a tiny stomach compared to the cow's rumen. Mm -hmm. And if that stomach is healthy, it is virtually sterile because right. it produces hydrochloric acid. A healthy stomach of a human being, the acidity goes beyond two pH, beyond two, sometimes even beyond one mm -hmm. when we are hungry. And that's an extremely hostile environment for any kind of microbe. It is a biochemical fact that has been established decades ago, that nothing on our planet can truly digest plants apart from microbes. So the human stomach is virtually a sterile environment. It has virtually no microbes in it. And the only things, hydrochloric acid, pepsin, and other elements that the stomach juice contains can digest truly are meat, fish, eggs, and dairy, mm -hmm. animal foods. Plants are just sit there and wait for their turn. Um, they don't they're indigestible for the yeah. human stomach. Then the whole mixture is passed into the intestines. Intestines are several meters long, uh, part of our digestive system where absorption happens, absorption mm -hmm. of the food. And the only things the intestines can absorb is what has been digested properly in the stomach and in the upper part of the duodenum, in the upper part of the intestine yeah. itself. Mm -hmm. And the only things that got properly digested, properly broken down were meat, fish, eggs, and dairy. Plants have moved in virtually undigested. So the only things they can contribute in the intestines in terms of absorption are some minerals, some vitamins, some cofactors, a few juices, phytonutrients. But the bulk 
of the stuff that feeds and builds the human body, the proteins and the fats, do not come from plants. They come only from animal foods. Then this whole mixture goes through the intestines and eventually lands in the bowel of the human being. And that's where the majority of our gut flora lives. That is the equivalent of rumen mm -hmm. in us humans. That's where the plants get digested to some degree by all those microbes in there. And again, sugars are converted to starch. Uh, um, and other sugars are converted into short-chain fatty acids, the saturated fat that sustains us between meals, mm -hmm. just like it happens in the cow. But the problem is, in the cow, her, her rumen is at the beginning of her digestive system. Right. So everything digests in there first, then it moves in the intestines, and it gets absorbed. In us human beings, our equivalent of rumen is at the end of mm -hmm. the digestive system. The absorption has already happened higher up. So the plants are really in no position to truly feed the human body. Your human body, if you take the water out of it, about 70% of human body is water. Mm -hmm. What's left, the dry weight, is 50-50, they're about fat and protein. Mm -hmm. When we analyze human protein in a laboratory, we find that it's in its biochemical structure, it's very similar to proteins in meat, fish, eggs, and dairy. So these proteins digest properly in the stomach and then they absorb and they are perfectly uh, designed for the human body to build its own protein. Mm -hmm. The same with fats. When we analyze human fat from your body, from a human body in a laboratory, we find that it's in its biochemical structure. It's very similar to the fat in meat, fish, eggs, and dairy. Mm -hmm. So human body, you have to understand, is renewing itself all the time. Majority of cells have a very short life in our bodies. They mm -hmm. die, they get shed off, and they get replaced by newly born baby cells. So the body is constantly giving birth to trillions of new baby cells. In order to do that, the body needs building materials to yeah. make these cells from something. It needs protein, it needs fat. The only suitable, abundant protein and fat that the body can receive for building itself all the time come from meat, fish, eggs and dairy. Animal, so animal foods are the feeding foods for us, the building foods for us. Plants are full of protein, but when we analyze that protein in the laboratory, we find it's completely inappropriate for the human physiology, for building our protein. It's, certain amino acids are missing, other amino acids are in excess, and overall the protein is indigestible. The well-known protein in the plants is gluten, for example. The more we're researching gluten, the more we're realizing no human being on this planet can really digest gluten. It damages everybody who eats it. It's, it's downright damaging and poisonous for the mm -hmm. human digestive system because it cannot be properly digested. And that's only one plant protein that we've researched very well. There are many, many others. And the more we're researching them, the more we're realizing that they're indigestible and they are damaging for mm -hmm. the human body. Plants are also full of fats, full of oils. But when we analyze the uh, composition in a laboratory, we find that it's inappropriate for building our fats in our human body because 50% of dry weight of you is fat. Fat is a structural element of your human body. It isn't an uh, option for mm -hmm. us. So plants are unable to build the human body. So what is their purpose then? Why do we eat plants at all? Their purpose is cleansing. They have powerful cleansing substances. They have phytonutrients, salicylates, phenols, juices, vitamins, minerals, and other things. So they are able to keep our bodies clean on the inside, to detoxify us all the time, to neutralize various toxins, remove them. That is the purpose of eating plants, truly. Mm -hmm. Traditional cultures all over the world knew this fact. They knew that plants are unable to feed them really, that they just cleanse them and, and provide some cofactors. So they would go a longer mile. They would put an extra effort into getting meat, fish, eggs and dairy and they would eat plants as a complement to those animal foods or when the animal foods were not available and they knew that plants are indigestible and that they can damage the digestive system in the human beings if they're not properly prepared so all traditional cultures around the world found ways of properly preparing plants to make them a little bit more digestible mm -hmm. a little bit more feeding a little bit easier on our digestive system so uh, th these methods were fermentation first and foremost sprouting molting, cooking, and preparation. There are, there are very complex recipes that exist in traditional cultures in order to make the plants a little bit more digestible. Mm -hmm. So that is the fact. Animal foods feed us and build our 
human bodies, our heavy brain, our big heart, big lungs, big liver, big digestive system, your big skeleton and so mm -hmm. on, which are constantly renewing themselves. So these foods are not only important for every age of the human being, they're vitally important for growing children, for babies, for pregnant women, for breastfeeding women, because a pregnant woman is building a body for her baby. Mm -hmm. And while she's breastfeeding, she's building a body for her baby. And children are growing. They need more building materials than perhaps an adult does. So animal foods are absolutely vital for the human beings to eat. It's, it's kind of interesting, isn't it? I find that uh, when we look at uh, the debate that goes on, perhaps on the internet, around the world, uh, regarding uh, vegetarianism as a, as a dietary approach, I tend to find that the battle always tends to be by comparing and contrasting the extremes, by looking at people who overeat meats and are almost carnivorous compared to people who only eat plant matter. And, and I just wonder if there's more of a, uh, uh, as, as you're starting to imply, there, there's a purpose for both, for, for animal foods and for plant foods. And I wonder if we could explore that for a minute by first asking, um, are there any beneficial properties and nutrients that plant foods can bring to the diet? And are there any concerns beyond what we've kind of summarized that are justifiable in the science with regards to certain plant foods? Of course, this division is not black and white, of course. Animal foods, particularly raw, animal foods have a, a powerful cleansing ability, as well as building ability. They can be powerful cleansers. We now know, for example, that raw egg white is powerful at removing toxic metals from right. the human body. Interesting. When we cook the egg, it loses that ability. It's only raw egg whites. And the same with plants, if they are properly prepared, if they're fermented, if they're sprouted, if they're properly cooked, uh, properly prepared to neutralize damaging substances and then making them more digestible can provide some building materials too for the mm -hmm. human body. But this division, but that's again not a large percent. This is, this is an overlap. I have a chapter in my book, Vegetarianism Explained, uh, where I explain how every human being needs to design their own uh, diet. Because we have to rely on our senses. Mm -hmm. Every human being is unique in this planet, on this planet. One size fits all doesn't work. What is good for your neighbor, what is good for another member of your family may not be so good for you because you are different genetically, you have different constitution, and our nutritional needs change all the time depending on the age, the weather, what you're doing, uh, mm -hmm. e even throughout the day. What your body needs at 8 o'clock in the morning is very different from what it needs at 6 o'clock in the evening. Mm -hmm. So in that chapter I explain how we need to listen to the body listen to its needs because the body communicates its nutritional needs to you all the time. We just human beings need to stop and start listening. We stop listening to our bodies. We do not listen. We need to start listening. You need to get back in touch with the uh, deep ancient wisdom that is programmed in your body. And your body will tell you what I need at this particular moment. Mm -hmm. And it might be just an apple for one person. But a couple of hours later, you do need a big a piece of meat with a lot of fat and cooked vegetables and the works, the, the whole thing. Because at that particular moment, your body is rebuilding itself. Where a couple of hours before, your body was busy cleansing itself and it needed an apple or it needed a salad or something else. Mm -hmm. So, and this needs change all the time. It's very, very individual. So no clever book and no clever scientist can prescribe to you what you need to eat for mm -hmm. breakfast, lunch, or dinner. You have to figure that out yourself, working with your own body. Mm -hmm. Make no mistake, human body is a miraculous creation. It has every ability to look after itself, to cleanse itself, to feed itself, and to heal itself from any damage, any disease. It's your own body that is healing itself, not the doctor, not the pill, not the diet, or anything else. Mm -hmm. but what we need to do, we modern human beings, we need to get back in touch with the ancient wisdom inside our bodies, that knowledge inside our bodies. We need to start listening to our bodies and giving them what they need. And then we can be health, healthy and well. Yeah, I enjoyed that, uh, that section of the book, actually. Uh, in particular, you talked about the senses of smell, taste, and appetite. Um, if we learn to listen to them, as you've just mentioned, that, that, that they can direct us to the things that we need. But I have a, a question regarding that, because for many people who are perhaps trying to transition from a, a, a typical Western diet, maybe with processed foods, trying to eat more healthy and more natural, how do they differentiate between the natural needs that the body is trying to communicate and them getting over you know, food addictions like the need for eating sugar or chocolate or things like that? The first thing to do is to eat things that Mother Nature provided for the human body. Mother Nature took billions of years to design our human bodies. 
It is the, the tip of the evolution on our planet. At the same time, Mother Nature designed all the foods which is suitable for feeding this body. Mm -hmm. And those foods are not the stuff you buy in packets and tins at the supermarket. Sure. Generally, supermarket is not a good place to buy your food. I tell my patients, every one of them, stop going to supermarkets. Go to farmer's markets, meet the farmers, then go and visit the farmers, and start buying directly from people who produce the food. And see how the animals are kept, how the birds are kept, how the vegetables are grown, and fruit, and other crops. So, you buy foods only in the shape of form that Mother Nature created it. And then you cook them at home, mm -hmm. using traditional recipes and traditional practices. There are many very good books around. Um, Western May Price Foundation will provide you with lots of excellent recipes and methods of preparing the food properly. Mm -hmm. And that is the only way to be healthy. You cannot trust the food industry to fill your stomach or the stomachs of your family because the food industry's agenda is profit, not your health. Your health is not on the agenda. Food industry uses a myriad of chemicals which are specifically designed to make processed foods addictive. The word that is used in industry is irresistible. Mm -hmm. But in reality, what they do, they turn you into a drug addict. They add drugs into your food, which make you an addict. One of the most addictive things on the planet is sugar. The second most addictive uh, thing is the wheat flour mm -hmm. on the planet. Everything made out of wheat flour in the modern world is addictive. And majority of humanity are addicted to it. They're addicted to sugar and then to that. And these things, they alter your perception of taste, your perception of what you need, what you desire. Once you stop eating processed, denatured foods, these are denatured foods, these are mm -hmm. dead rubbish that you're polluting your body with. Once you stop eating these things, your body will clean up. It will take a few weeks, but it will clean up, and your normal, real senses will return. You will be able to get in touch with them again, to perceive them properly, to mm -hmm. understand them. And then you will be able to start feeding yourself the way your body asks for it, mm -hmm. the, the, the way you, you should. So we have to go well, through that cleansing sort of process before we're, we're going to feel more in tune with the way our body wants us to eat. It is. It's very important because we have to stop eating processed foods. That is the cause of every degenerative disease in the world, mm -hmm. of all the disasters that people are going through. Processed mm -hmm. foods and other man-made things that we have um, flooded our planet with. Amazingly, we're, we're almost out of time, Natasha. It's been fascinating listening to you as you've, you've talked about some of these principles. But if someone was considering, I, I will do a final question here. If someone was considering a, a change towards a vegetarian lifestyle and they hadn't done it before and they, they were trying to be healthy, uh, you're probably aware January is often a, a month where people uh, shift towards vegetarianism. Um, if they were trying to do that, what piece of advice would you offer them at this point? Please read my book first. It is possible to be a healthy vegetarian, but you need to know what you're doing. Mm -hmm. Because if you don't do it correctly, you can get into serious trouble. This guided vegetarianism is now rapidly becoming a major cause of mental illness amongst our young people. And not only mental illness, but autoimmune disease, allergies, and fibromyalgia, chronic fatigue syndrome, and other disasters, absolutely disastrous situations. I had all these young girls in my clinic who started off being perfectly healthy children. Mm -hmm. perfectly healthy young girls and then they decided to become vegetarians for whatever reason and they not only destroyed their health they destroyed their lives it is extremely difficult to unwind that path once you start sliding down it mm -hmm. extremely difficult to return back to your health no, right, thank you. And, and I'm assuming that, particularly with those girls, it, it would have been that they were living the convenience food lifestyle as a vegetarian. Is that what you're saying? Absolutely. Yes, they lived on processed foods. They had no idea what they were doing. They had no idea how to feed their bodies, how to listen to their bodies. So they fall into a typical trap. Mm -hmm. And uh, if a person follows, depending on what form of vegetarian or veganism they follow, they either can fall into the mental illness and neurological illness, pan wagon, they develop multiple sclerosis, uh, amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, Parkinson's disease, dementia, memory problems, schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, anorexia, and so on. None of it is nice. None of it is pleasant. All of it destroys your life completely. Or they can develop um, obesity, heart disease, metabolic syndrome, diabetes, and other problems.
Mm-hmm. And I think it's important to, to point out there, Dr. Natasha, that, that these problems primarily are coming from choosing vegetarianism as a result of eating, but with a processed convenience food approach. Uh, and many of those disorders you've identified are, are also plausible for people who are meat eaters on a processed foods diet as well. They're not exclusive Absolutely. to one group. Uh, Absolutely. Yeah. And I really appreciate your thoughts uh, on this and that if someone wants to make a major change, like becoming a vegetarian, that they should do it in an informed manner. They need to go and learn, understand what it takes to eat in that way so that I can continue to be healthy. Because like you said, it's perfectly possible, but it shouldn't just be a flippant change. It should be something that's planned just like any dietary approach. Absolutely. All right. Well, thank you so much for your time. It's been a pleasure to have you on the show. Uh, I'm certainly going to, uh, to link up some of the things that we talked about, such as the Western A. Price Foundation, so that the listeners can find that on the show notes. Dr. Natasha, thank you. Uh, you have yourself a wonderful day. That's a pleasure. Thank you. If you enjoyed this podcast, please subscribe and share via social media. You can also rate the show on iTunes, Stitcher, or YouTube. If you'd like to know more about us, then check out our range of online courses at www.nordicfitnesseducation.com.